Good afternoon, Lewis Gray here from Google Developers Live in Mountain View, Googleplex. I want to talk here with uh, JJ Burns. He's a developer advocate for YouTube APIs. Welcome, JJ. Thanks. Nice to see you, Lewis. Good to see you. I love this new studio. We're just kicking off today. It's pretty so exciting. So you were the, the first one to talk about this. We're getting prepped for Google I.O. next week, uh, running through tutorials. And you went ahead and did a talk on Ruby on Rails, and specifically how it applied to YouTube and education. That's right. So what I want to do is go ahead and have a quick conversation with you and explain how does Ruby on Rails uh, involve with YouTube and education? Maybe you can walk through that for us. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit in the talk itself. Um, you know, it's a little bit strange talking about Ruby on Rails at Google because if you look at our jobs postings, oftentimes they'll mention Java or C++ or Python, but not very often will they mention Ruby. And definitely, I don't think I've ever seen them mention Rails. And then if you look at uh, Ruby and Rails talks, oftentimes they're talking about Heroku and Amazon EC2, but they don't spend as much time talking about uh, Google APIs. Mm -hmm. And you know, since I kind of straddle the fence, I do a little bit of Python, a little bit of Ruby on Rails. Um, I wanted to change that. You know, I, I know that you, our YouTube APIs work perfectly well in Ruby, and so I wanted to show people how it's done. Now, one of the questions I know a lot of people run into with YouTube is they have a certain expectation of what that site represents. You know, people look at us for entertainment or for news. What does it have to do with education? Because you took a very specific approach to this. Yeah, well, you know, it, strangely enough, YouTube actually can be used for things other than just cats. Mm -hmm. um, not Although that we cats like are the cat videos. yeah, we like the cats. The cats are important. You know, th those are a staple of our business, mm -hmm. but. Uh, you know, education's important. I actually have six kids, and so education's really important to me, and especially scalable education. Mm -hmm. I want good, high-quality, scalable education. And I think that uh, video makes that possible, scalable. You, you have a great lecture, you get it on video, and you know, you could reuse it over and over again. Um, one of my favorite examples is the, is the lectures, are the lectures by, um, the MIT guys, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, these are like a staple of good computer science from the MIT guys. And I watched those videos all the way through, and I feel like I got you know just a little bit of an mm -hmm. MIT education out of mm -hmm. those. And that's something. I don't know if you can put it on the resume, uh, but it sounds like a good place to find out yeah. good education and expand your world of knowledge. Uh, what do you think about TDD? I mean, when we went through your talk, you talked a lot about TDD, and I know people are curious about this. Does Google use it? Uh, how does it get involved? So uh, test-driven development is a way of developing software in which you write the test first, and then you watch it fail, and then you uh, try to write the code so that it makes the test pass, and then once you're passing, then you refactor the code so that it works better. And, you know, Google's a big place, and we have a lot of engineers, and, you know, we have this, we have this saying that, you get two Googlers in a room and you'll have three opinions. And so, of course, not all of them are going to agree on one particular way to develop software. But testing at Google is incredibly important. And so a lot of people do use test-driven development. And even those people who don't use test-driven development uh, find that writing comprehensive tests is an incredibly important part of their job. And so I wanted to talk about how to do test-driven development with web APIs, because that's hard. If you've ever used the YouTube API, uh, the responses that it gives you are very complex, they're large, and so it's hard to figure out, you know, what, am I, what response am I going to get? You know, I, I don't know ahead of time until I actually try it. And so a part of the talk is uh, showing people how to get the response so that they could play with it and then integrate it into their tests so that they could do test-driven development with realistic responses from YouTube without actually requiring a network connection in order to run your tests. Now, the test-driven development sounds a lot like Google's approach launching and iterating. You know, you get it out the door and you continue to improve. Uh, for me, at least when I took something resembling computer science, you know, I didn't get the kind of BS degree that most of us have around here. But my tests always seemed to fail. And I could never understand, you know, you would look at creating content and creating uh, code and writing out a sheet of paper didn't make sense. It was always about putting into the machine and trying and trying and seeing where did it break. Uh, is that something that you see kind of fits in with the corporate culture in terms of, you know, testing and, and iterating and accepting something that uh, needs some iteration going forward? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that your tests always fail because I have the opposite problem. <laughs> I like to spend, you know, tons of time writing code and then I code review it and it's perfectly polished. All my tests pass and then the first time I give it to a user, 
it blows up in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so s definitely test-driven development is a way so that you, the programmer who's writing the software codes it to be one way and the tests verify that it behaves that way. But then when you need to change it, the tests protect you from breaking software that used to work. And when you get code that's as large as it is at Google, that becomes really important. We have you know, just a couple engineers around here, and so mm -hmm. we have to be able to work together. And so we have to be able to extend software written by someone else without breaking it. Absolutely. Now, when you were talking, you mentioned version 3 of the YouTube APIs. What can you tell us about version 3? You know, why is it significant? I know a lot of times you look at iterations and they have point releases. What's going on in version 3 that uh, made this the one you want to talk about? Uh, well, you're always trying to get me to leak information. That's how we make these videos so, isn't mm -hmm. it? Absolutely. Um, so, currently, YouTube, uh, the YouTube API is at version 2.1, and version 2.x has been out for a long time. Uh, but we have some interesting talks going on, on at Google I.O., I will say that much. Um, and the, another thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, if you look at a lot of the newer Google APIs, such as the Google Plus APIs, uh, they have a, this very, very nice um, client um, API, what do you call that, a driver or whatever, um, client library that's really nice in that the client library automatically updates itself to match the API so that the client libraries don't go out of date. And so this is, you know, a problem that we've had in the YouTube world for a long time in that, you know, sometimes we'll make changes in our API and the REST API will be very well documented, um, you know, very, very functional, super, super stable, but the client libraries kind of sometimes lag a little bit behind, especially since we have to support so many programming languages. So this goes, this problem kind of goes away with the newer client libraries. Um, they will automatically um, adjust themselves for whatever the API currently is. And so, uh, you know, I really look forward to a future with um, up-to-date client libraries. Mm -hmm. Now, Jarek actually had a question. You were kind of getting close to this issue. We were talking about dynamic languages a little bit ago. So Jarek was saying, you know, he's told the time saved with dynamic languages such as Ruby can inv be invested in better test coverages, which leads to better software. Do you think that that's true, or do developers usually take that time savings to just go watch more YouTube videos? Uh, well, you know, it's tough because I, I, I try to do a little bit of both, you know? It's like, you know, I, I do want to watch those YouTube videos. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is a, a thinking that's uh, a way of thinking that's been popular um, uh, in the programming world for a while. I think it was. Um, Bruce Eckle, I forget, uh, the guy who wrote Thinking in Java who first pointed this out. And, you know, I think that this idea is popular in the Python world, but it's even more popular in the Ruby on Rails world. Um, the Ruby on Rails world, uh, of all the programming communities out there, they seem to be the most devoted to testing and test-driven development. And so Ruby on Rails lets you program software incredibly quickly, and yet it could turn to mush pretty quickly if you don't, you know, keep keep a hold of it. And so using test-driven development um, with a very, very strong test suite is how you keep you know the wheels from coming off the car that's flying down the road at 70 miles an hour. And is that why you use a debugger to code how to do this? So so the debugging trick is, is kind of a funny trick. And I did this even before I was a Ruby on Rails developer. When you're coding in an advanced, um, in a very dynamic programming language, you know, there's so much stuff that's going on at runtime. You just can't statically an analyze the code in order to figure out what's going on. You know, so much stuff is like being injected and meta classes and, and all kinds of funky stuff, meta programming happening at runtime. And so sometimes the only way, the only source of truth is the actual running program. And so I discovered, you know, years ago that the best way to write software is fire up the program, get it going, and then dump yourself into the debugger in the middle of the running program, and then look around, play around with what variables you have. Um, and the, the debuggers for uh, Python and Ruby aren't like the debuggers for C, where it's just you know, a way to inspect the state. Rather, they're shells, so you could write code in them. And I use this trick to write lots of code in the debugger, get it all working, and then copy and paste it into my program. Mm -hmm. Great trick. Now, I'm going to get you back to version 3. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to get you to leak stuff before. Maybe if I continue to ask you, you'll keep leaking. Uh, so we were talking about client libraries before. What do the client libraries have to do with version 3 of the YouTube API? Yeah, so the, the, the big key here is um, 
we're going to be talking about version 3 um, coming out and it's based on the new API infrastructure and uh, Google has this new API infrastructure that's used by some of the newer Google APIs and because we now have this common API infrastructure we have things like um, consolidated developer keys but this new API infrastructure is also what makes it possible for all the APIs at Google to behave the same. We'd like it if we could get to the point where a developer knows how to develop with Google APIs and when he needs to use a new API, it just kind of makes sense because it works like everything else and he doesn't need a new client library for every new API. He could just use his existing client library because that client library should just automatically know how to work with that API. And that that's the goal. It's slowly taking place at Google. You know, some of the products have already moved over and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Now, C. Truman from LA was having a question, fired it over the moderator. Oh, great. Uh, beyond education, uh, what are some other app ideas that could be implemented using YouTube APIs with Ruby on Rails? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, it's funny. When, when I first did this talk, it's like I had this goal. I wanted to talk about education because, you know, I wanted to spend a little while, you know, devoted to education. And I wanted to talk about Ruby on Rails. And I was like, how the heck do I do these two things at the same time? Because, you know, I only have a fixed amount of time to, you know, write some software, give some talks. How do I do these things at the same time? So I was like, whatever, I'll just do both of them at the same time. But the fact of the matter is you could write educational apps in Python and you could write, you know, non-educational apps in Ruby on Rails. It, it kind of doesn't matter. I, you know, by having the one talk, I address the two different things at the same time. But you know, mix and match. There's lots of different ways to do education and lots of different um, programming languages and there's lots of different things that you could do with Ruby and Rails other than education. Now I'm going to ask you a different question. Now you've been at YouTube for about a year. Yep. Uh, how would you say YouTube is a little bit different possibly than the rest of Google? What's really unique about being a developer there and developer you know, advocate? It, it's funny. It's 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 a subtle thing. We we like to say that it's a ghetto in the in the in the good way. You know, like uh, my grandmother came from a Russian ghetto, and you know it it was a nice place for her. According to her, she says you know like everyone knew each other, everyone liked each other. YouTube, that's definitely the case. We are you know a little bit of a niche. Um, my key card does still work in all the different places in Google, and you know that's good because I like to eat at all the different cafes. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a lot of the same, pro we have pretty much all the same process, we use all the same tools. Um, but, you know, there's a little bit of a focus, a uh, little bit of a different focus. I, you know, I watch a couple videos a day at, at Google, you know, at even, I, I don't know if it's as well accepted in other parts of Google to just, you know, chill out for 20 minutes and watch mm -hmm. some YouTube, but it's definitely well, the case. You can that's chill out, watch YouTube videos and say, no, I'm working, in case the boss comes by. Oh, so yeah, I'm that's definitely like, that's, although, you know, the the normal trick of, you know, being a software engineer and saying my code, co my code's compiling, right. that does not work at YouTube because most of our software is written in Python, so there's no compiling. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, really, so. Well, anything else we should tell everybody before we head off and uh, start working to get ready for I.O.? Oh, jeez. You know, is it time to go to sleep yet? I mean, I'm exhausted. Uh, no, there's time for that. That's the July 4th week, I believe. Oh, is that right? Yeah, Man, this Google I.O. stuff, wow. It's a busy time. I'm super excited about it. I know we have a lot of great talks coming up at Google I.O. Um, a lot of great YouTube talks because I... You know, I've been watching all the rehearsals, and uh, I know that we're leaking as many things as we possibly can to get people excited about it. Well, there's lots of news coming up. I'm sure we don't have time to cover. I all know, that. I know, but I'm super. Ex I'm excited to see that keynote because even I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I won't tell you. All right. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, JJ, for thanks taking lot, the Lewis. time with us. Appreciate it. Very nice. Thanks.